some basic reflections. I will talk maybe for about five to ten minutes about spirituality in general, and then if you have any questions, we will let the question answers lead the discussion. <clears throat> All of us in our lives, sometime or other, get demoralized. Uh, we just don't feel like doing anything. Now, usually, when this happens, at that time, uh, often something has gone wrong. And then, we have to, how we see that thing that has gone wrong, that determines our response. So, I was in, last, last year I was in America. I was at a conference on mental health and spirituality. And there are many people suffer from depression. So, many of these people who are struggling with depression, they are also sharing how they go into depression and what helps them to come off depression. And then we were talking about spiritual principles that could be applied. So, there's one girl and a young woman. She was studying in a good university in America. And she also was waiting... Uh, to get some money on the way, she was used to wait on tables. And one day she was carrying a glass of water and suddenly the glass of water, she was going to serve a customer, the glass slipped from her hands and fell down. And just because of that, she started thinking, I am so useless, I can't carry even a glass of water. What am I going to achieve in my life? What kind of career can I have? What kind of relationships can I have? What kind of future can I have? So just the glass slipping from her hands triggered a massive depression in her. And she eventually had to be hospitalized and treated. So now, for how many of us the glass has slipped from our hands? You know, <laughs> almost every one of us. <laughs> now, how many of us went into depression because of that? <laughs> we may say it's very silly. But this brings uh, to attention a very light, to light an important point about how the mind works. See, every single thing we can put in different frames. Just like right now, if... Uh, Somebody was looking at this house or if somebody is clicking a photo. Now, if they want to know who is the speaker, they might put the frame only on the speaker. If they want to know how many people have come for the program, they might put the frame a little bigger. If they want to know, okay, how big is the space for the program, they might put the frame even a little bigger. If they want to know, okay, what locality is this in, they might go outside and for a helicopter, click the photo and see what is the locality, what kind of buildings are nearby. So the same thing, same <coughs> can be put in different frames. And intelligence means to put every issue in the most constructive frame. So that means, say if a glass is slipped from the hand, now it could be that the same incident, it could be explained in different ways. It could be Okay, maybe the glass was slippery. Maybe I was distracted. Or maybe the floor was slippery and because of that the glass slipped from my hand. Or maybe suddenly somebody spoke loudly and that distracted me. Now, all these could be possible explanations. So, one is, is the nature of the glass. The second is, uh, my own inattentiveness. The third is, the, sl the slipperiness of the floor. The fourth is, the noisiness of the other people over there. So, the same incident can be put in different frames. And when we put a, now at a normal functional level, we actually do this analysis and we put things in the right frame. But sometimes when we face problems, if we put the problem in the wrong frame, say to think that the glass has slipped from my hand and because of that, life is useless or my life is useless. That's putting that issue in the wrong frame. Wrong in the sense that it is unproductive, it is counterproductive. 
So spiritual knowledge is what we need when the normal frames in which we put issues don't work. So when all of us normally have a plan for our life, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. But sometimes during the course of our lives, we come to a sudden dead end. Life, we seem to be going straight and suddenly on that straight clear road, a sudden blockage comes. I just, I can't move ahead at all. Such was the situation of Arjuna. Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita was a warrior who was about to fight the biggest war of his life. This was a war for which he had prepared throughout his life. And suddenly, just before the war, he looked and he saw, these are all my relatives. These are some of my worshipable elders. These are my friends with whom I grew up playing. How can I fight against them? And thinking this, he said, I can't fight. And then he said, what can I do now? He had a responsibility to fight. He said, I can't fight. So initially his frame was that these are vicious people. They are adharmic and they need to be punished. That was one frame he had. Initial frame, basically they had offended his, they had insulted his wife, they had stolen their kingdom and they were vicious. That was one frame. But suddenly the frame changed and he saw, oh, they are all my relatives, how can I fight with them? So the one frame put him, I should fight. The other frame, I cannot fight. So when we have these two frames, the same issue can be framed in one way and it impels us to one course of action. The same issue is framed in another way, it impels us to another course of action. That's when we get confusion. And if confusion is not resolved, then we go into dejection, which can go further down into clinical depression and more serious things. So spiritual knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita helped Arjun to expand his frame. So, the, so Arjun at the start of the Gita was so disheartened that he just put aside his bow, saying, I can't fight. Misrujya sasharam chapam shokasam vigna manasaha. Put aside his book, shoka samvigna, completely filled with lamentation. But by the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna, Yatra Partho Dhanurdhara, Tatra Shreer Vijayo Bhutir, Dhruvani Tirma Tirmama. So Arjun has picked up his bow, Dhanurdhara. He's become ready to do his duty, ready to answer the call of duty. And with him being thus ready, the Bhagavad Gita concludes the prophecy that victory will be his, morality will be on his side, prosperity will be on his side. So what happened, that same Arjuna at the start of the Gita was disheartened putting his bow aside. At the end of the Gita had raised his bow in readiness to fight. The Gita expanded his frame. Expanded his frame means the Gita helped him understand that his purpose was not just to fight a war to gain back a kingdom, nor was it to not fight a war to uh, protect, his, uh, protect his relatives. To his purpose was that he was a spiritual being. And beyond whatever plans we have in our life, there is a higher plan at work. There is a higher plan which is for our good and for everyone's good. And we have to do our part in that plan. So the Bhagavad Gita shifted Arjuna's vision from matter to spirit. You are not just the body, you are a soul. And not just to the soul, but in the spirit, there is a supreme spirit. That is God. That is Krishna. The Bhagavad Gita shifted his vision. And when the vision shifted, the situation remained the same. But the frame in which that situation was seen was different. And he saw that the supreme cared for him and cared for everyone. And if he just did what was the right thing at that time, acted in the mood of loving service to Krishna, good will come to everyone. Karishye vachanam tava And thus he said, I will do your will. So, of course, the philosophy of the Gita is complex. 
but basically by getting a vision that his plan his purpose was thwarted this way was no use this way was no use but when his vision his frame expanded and he could see that yes there is although there seems to be a dead end here there is a way ahead but similarly for us when we feel disheartened spiritual knowledge can help us to adjust the frame so that rather than seeing only the negativity of the situation we put that situation in a more constructive frame where we can see a positive way ahead now our plans can sometimes many times get frustrated but still beyond our plans there is a higher plan sometimes bad things happen in life however everything that happens is not good but everything that happens can be for good bad things happen and we just focus on the bad thing then we get disheartened but by a higher plan even if a bad thing has happened good can come out of it and we can also introspect in our lives we will see that many of the things that we when they happened in our past in our life we thought it was very bad now 5 years 10 years down the line we say that actually good things have come out of it so by putting things in a bigger frame spiritual knowledge helps us to respond constructively to life's adversities to everything that happens may appear some things that happen may appear to be very bad but by putting them in a proper spiritual frame seeing that there is a higher reality there is a higher plan and operation we can become more positive again so these are just a few starting thoughts so any thoughts any comments any questions yeah please what is spirituality okay so what is spirituality you could say there are essentially three parts to it first is that spirituality at one level means that there is a spiritual reality spirituality is spiritual plus reality that we live in physical reality we look for material things so so beyond what is visible beyond what is physically tangible there is something higher to life and it is this higher reality which makes us long for love long for happiness not just love and happiness but lasting love and lasting happiness all of us if we see there, there are so many we all long not just to love but to love forever movies the novels many of them are about romance and they say i want to live forever love forever so why forever nothing around us lasts forever but still we have a strong desire this for this forever if we are simply material creatures then our desires would come from matter and in matter there is no experience of anything which is lasts forever so why do we get this desire if a child is living in a remote african tribal forest and there the child suddenly says mom i want a pizza when did you he hear about a pizza there's nothing in, a, in the child's vicinity to ever get that create that desire within it so just the fact that we have a desire for something which is not present at all in the world around us that indicates that there's something about us which is does not belong to the world around us everything around is material but we have a desire to live forever so spirituality the first level means there is a spiritual reality at another level the way today the word spirituality is used it basically used to refer to anything that makes us feel good that's the idea oh it's a very spiritual place what does that mean when people use that they say that okay when i go there i feel good i feel peaceful i feel uplifted maybe there's some vibrations over there so today the word spirituality is used not so much in the metaphysical sense of there existing a higher reality but in the sense that anything that makes me feel good that's what we call as spiritual so spirituality refers to spiritual reality spirituality can also refer to the emotions that we experience this this the sense of peace or harmony that we experience now beyond that a third level spirituality can refer to the 
process by which we experience that higher emotion and we, we experience the higher reality. So there are, so if we conceive of a mountain, the bottom of the mountain is material consciousness, the top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness. And uh, spirituality is the process by which we rise from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain. So meditation, kirtan, prayer, worship, study of wisdom texts, these are all ways in which you can rise up. So the processes for raising our own consciousness can also be called as spirituality. So it can refer to spiritual reality, it can refer to our emotions of peace and serenity and it can refer to the processes that take us towards the spiritual level of consciousness. Now what exists at the top of the mountain? You know, great wisdom texts such as the Bhagavad Gita have told us that. And we can get some glimpse of that. So at, that level, at spiritual consciousness, we realize, going back to the first point, that we have a longing for love, which lasts forever. So it's, the Bhagavad Gita essentially says that spiritual, rea spiritual reality has three components. There is the soul, who is spiritual and eternal, who, which is who we are. And there is the whole, there is the divine, known by different names and different traditions known in Bhagavad Gita by the name Krishna and is a, that is the supreme spiritual reality and then there is spiritual love between the two of them so in that spiritual reality at the top of the mountain uh, what is what goes on is the longing for eternal love is fulfilled over there in the exchange of love between the inf between the finite soul like all of us and the infinite soul is God so realizing and participating in that eternal exchange of love that is considered to be the perfection of spirituality. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. How we achieve liberation? Okay. How can we achieve liberation? First of all, if you have to achieve liberation, we need to understand two things. What are how are we bound now and how are we bound now? And what do we mean by liberation? So it's like, if say, if I want to go to, uh, <clears throat> if I want to go to a particular place, if I want to, I just now came from Melbourne. So if I want to go to Melbourne, first I need to know, okay, where am I and where is Melbourne? And then I can find a path from here to there. So if you want to, how do we achieve liberation? You know, understand what is the bound state? What is the liberated state? Then we can talk about the process to go there. So we are considered bound in the present stage because we all long for lasting life and lasting love but that is never fulfilled for us at a ultimate level all our dreams for lasting life and lasting love are going to be shattered by death and even before that we are bound in various ways and various limitations so one limitation is time our existence is just for a finite time and we cannot extend that. It's going to, when it's end, death when it comes, it will be unappealable, just final. So that's one, that's a, the duration is one limitation. Then within that, our own ability is one limitation. If we want to fly, we cannot fly on our own. We need airplanes. There are so many things which we can't do. So many things, again, which we, which we feel will give us enjoyment, by which we can begin happiness, we can't do those things. So we basically exist in a limited state right now. And this limited state is the state of bondage. And this limited state exists, the Bhagavad Gita explains, because we are spiritual beings, but we are attached to, temp to material things. So. Suppose, uh, suppose somebody is an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Now that alcoholic may go from Australia to America. And in a sense they say, I am free, I can go wherever I want. But once the urge to drink hits them, whether they are in Australia or America or Africa, they will be pulled to a bar. I have to go and drink. So where is this bondage? Physically there are no ropes. But in the mind, there are ropes that drag them, invisible ropes. So, 
just now addicts are an extreme example of bondage but similarly all of us are bound by our desires asha pashe chatair baddha in the bhagavad gita 16 chapter krishna says in the 12th verse that the desire to enjoy temporary things binds us to the temporary world so bondage means the desire to enjoy wealth power uh, pleasure position possessions all this all these desires they bind us to the world so that is the bound state the liberated state is the state where we are not bound by any worldly desires we don't have any worldly desires rather we exist in a state free from all desires for temporary things so we have we exist with love for that eternal spiritual reality so liberation means when we learn to become absorbed in the eternal to become in love with the eternal then that is the state of liberation so now if you consider this point that when our desires are directed towards temporary worldly things that's what causes bondage when the desire is directed towards eternal spiritual reality and the highest spiritual reality is god is known by different names again by krishna, krishna we can say as the bhagavata says so when the desires are directed towards krishna then we go to that spiritual level of reality where there is no limitation of death where there is no limitation when in doing the activities that give us happiness so then the process for liberation will be the process that redirects our desires from temporary material things to the eternal spiritual being there are different processes sorry <clears throat> for becoming liberated there are different processes for liberation just as say we could say the bottom of the mountain top of the mountain you could have different paths to go up the mountain now all paths may go up the mountain <coughs> or many paths may go up the mountain but that doesn't necessarily mean that all, all the paths are equally easy so there are some processes of liberation which focus primarily on detachment that attachment to temporary material things causes bondage so become detached become detached and the more we become detached the idea is the more we will become liberated and yes detachment is required but this is a very difficult and negative centered process it's focused on what we are meant to give up the other process could be that we cultivate uh, attraction towards the spiritual so so it is a desire to it is a, it's it's the desire to enjoy temporary material things that binds us but instead if we cultivate a desire for spiritual reality and as the desire goes stronger we will move towards liberation so that desire grows by the process of bhakti yoga bhakti yoga essentially is the process abhyasa yogena tatto maam ichchaptum dhananjaya in 12.9 in the bhagavad gita krishna says that if you practice abhyasa yoga abhyasa yoga means we practice the process of bhakti say we chant the names of krishna we do bhajan of krishna we do puja of krishna abhyasa we try to fix the mind on krishna by this maam ichchaptum dhananjaya our desire for krishna will become stronger and stronger and as the desire for krishna enters into our consciousness and then fills our consciousness then we will see everything as connected with krishna then we will see temporary we will see the temporary material things but we won't see them separate from krishna so instead of seeing thinking of our family members as my family members and getting attached to them and getting bound we'll see that these are also souls who are parts of krishna by krishna's arrangement now i am put in a particular family i am in a particular family and by sir, taking care of my family members in a mood of service to krishna not just seeing them as the ultimate end but seeing them in connection with krishna then even by acting in the world we can move towards liberation so somebody has a job 
they can see that job simply as a means I want to earn money, I want to get a big house, I want to show the world how great I am. That mentality will bind them. But instead if they think that, okay, I have a job now, I have to earn a living and I have been given some abilities. So let me work hard to do justice to my abilities, to that that God has given me and to make a contribution in life. Let me use my <coughs> abilities to work in a mood of worship to Krishna, to convert my home into temple, to maintain the home temple nicely, to take care of my family members who are also parts of Krishna. So when we work in a mood of worship to Krishna, even that work can take us towards liberation. So basically, the way to move towards liberation is to spiritualize our desires, to direct our desires from temporary material things to the eternal spiritual being. And the process that does this redirection of our desires is the process of Bhakti Yoga. So by practicing Bhakti Yoga, we can progress towards liberation. Okay? Thank you. Yes? You talked about how Krishna changed, uh, sorry, how uh, Arjuna changed his view. Right? Correct. Get into the frame where he can fight his own people. What are the steps we can implement in our life to change the negative situations to a positive one? Simple steps. What can we do? Okay. How do we <coughs> do it and hmm. what we can do? Okay. So, how can we change? our frame so from a positive to negative, how did Arjuna do it? So how it happened exactly for Arjuna, um, that will require going into details of the Bhagavad Gita's philosophy. But uh, broadly as I said, it, he raised his vision from matter to spirit and from spirit to the supreme spirit. So now how, how can we do that if we are a negative frame? There are different ways but I let us take one situation. Uh, say if we are overcome by fear, if we are overcome by fear, fear, oh, what if I, what if I get cancer, what if I lose my job, what if this happens, what if that happens, what if, uh, the what if can lead to a mind to go on a horrendous path of imagination. So now at that time, to raise our consciousness, uh, to put things in the right frame, uh, I've given seminars on overcoming fear, so I talk about acronym fear, F-E-A-R. So F is focus. Focus means what is the exact problem right now? So, you know, okay, what if I lose my job? Okay, what is the exact problem right now? Oh, you know, somebody was fired from my company. Somebody was fired from my company. Okay, but what is the exact problem right now? Oh, I may get fired. Okay, that's a possibility in future. What is the exact problem right now? Oh, my boss is unhappy because I have not completed my project in time. Oh, so focus, what is the exact problem right now? So, by fo when we focus on something which is tangible for us, sometimes putting ourselves in the right frame means bringing the zoom down so that we focus on the small or sometimes expanding the zoom to focus on the big. It requires appropriate. So first thing is come down to specifics. Focus on what is the exact problem right now. Like for that girl, what is the exact problem right now? Okay, this water has slipped. This water has slipped from my hand. Okay, this water has spilled on the ground. <coughs> then E is engage. Engage means what can I do about it right now? So as uh, by this what happens, by these two things focus and engage, we get something tangible to deal with. Otherwise, fear sets us fighting against an invisible enemy. You know, it's like if the enemy is in, from where do, what do I fight against? Just feel that I am being attacked every, from everywhere. So by focus and engage, we get, give a tangible form to the attacker, attacking enemy. Now the enemy may be much bigger than that also. But right now, this is the attack. So engage. So what can I do right now? Okay, this water has fallen now, let me mop it. This glass is broken, let me carry, the, take the shards and put them aside. Engage. Then, A is arise. 
Arise means raise your consciousness to the spiritual level. Yes, I made this mistake, but I am not a mistake. Hmm? I may do something terrible, but I am not someone terrible. Why? Because I am a soul. I am a part of God. Because God is all good, as a part of Him, I am also all good. I am also good. Yes, there may be some bad things around me. I may have some weaknesses. I may have some shortcomings. But at, uh, at my core, I am spiritual. So, A is arise. Remind yourself of your spirituality. Remind yourself that beyond whatever bad things are happening to me, or even bad emotions are coming within me, even whatever bad actions have been done by me, beyond it all, at my core, I am a soul. I am good. I am as a part of God. I am spiritual. I am indestructible. I am safe. So this gives us some inner security and stability. And then R R is release. Release means let go. That which is not in my control. What if that goes wrong? That goes wrong. That goes wrong. Okay. I am not the supreme controller, there is a higher control. So, the A gets us to the first level of spiritual awareness, that is, I am spiritual. But R and shift the focus to, like I said, the Bhagavad Gita, shift the focus on the body to the soul, to the supreme. So, R is where we shift the vision to the supreme. That, see, within a materialistic vision, there are only two options, either two ways of looking at reality. Either things are in my control or things are out of control. But in the spiritual vision, we understand that things that are out of my control are not out of control. They are under a higher control. And so, what that plan is, why things are happening like this, I don't know right now. But if that is not in my control, let me not waste my emotional energy in trying to control it and worrying about it. Release. Let, let go of that. So by that what happens? If we adjust the frame so that we have something specific we can do, something actionable, and at the same time, we also have security about that which is not actionable for us. So that way, we can place ourselves, place our issues in a constructive frame. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So, as a parent, we are very attached to our children. And uh, I also understand that uh, it's our responsibility to look after their spiritual upbringing as well. Mm. But often we are always caught up, you know, the societal pressure, the family pressure to always send them to the best schools where there's a lot of competition, where their soul might be crushed, where their spirit might be crushed, especially in a country like this. If you want to fit into a certain mold, if you go to private school, there's expectation for your child to behave in certain way, which for us is not spiritual or which is not right. So you have been in that competitive environment, you have achieved, overachieved. So what is the advice to give? Because you know, like you seem to be a good parent if you're not pushing your children. But personally for me, for being a good parent is letting your child be what they are. So, you know, that's a dilemma I'm facing right now. Should you be a pushy parent asking your child to achieve, be more than they are? Or accepting them and loving them just as they are? Oh, God. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> so, should we just, uh, when, as a, what does it mean to be a good parent? Should we push our children to become better than what they are? Or should we accept them for what they are right now? Right now, my concern is choosing a school which fits in with my <laughs> frame or okay. societal frame, whatever yeah, frame so that we're doing. So that's my dream. I understand. So if you had to choose a particular school, um, well, let me begin with a caveat. I have no experience, experience in parenting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you're so happy to <laughs> uh, But yes, I have also, as a counselor or a mentor, I have dealt with not very small children, but I have dealt with many parents. So some experience, some principles I can say, specifics you will have to apply. So there are times uh, when all of us need to be pushed. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the human mind 
is a very fickle thing. So if somebody is discouraged and uh, they just they are feeling a lack of confidence whether they can do it or not, at that time they need to be encouraged. Now what may encourage them? Sometimes it may be you can do it. Sometimes it may be that you know you are good night right now also. So it's it's like say if we are going on a journey and at that time sometimes oh there is the destination that may inspire us to move forwards or sometimes oh I have already covered this much distance that may encourage us. So, so you know, depending on the consciousness of a particular person, what will encourage them and what will discourage them? For somebody, you can see the destination, you say, so far away. The side of the destination may discourage them. But for somebody else, oh, it's, 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 I can see it, I will get there. So basically, uh, rather than thinking that, it's one course of action, whether to push someone or to accept someone. Uh, accept, it's that we have to see what is their frame of mind right now. So, it is that somebody that's lethargic and uh, apathetic, then a little pushing is required. So, <clears throat> on the other hand, if somebody is very disheartened, oh, I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. And they need a, basically what they need a boost, a boost of morale at that time. But if at that time we push them, they may start feeling that, you know, that means you don't accept me as I am. Unless I become like that, you won't, I can't have your love. So there, is a, there are two different things which often get confused in relationships. And that is what creates a problem. There is love and there is expectation. Now we may say expectation is a natural part of love. That is true. It is. But it is the two are need to be separated. That at one level, love, especially in a committed relationships, needs to be given unconditionally. However, you are, I accept you, I love you. But at the same time, I would like you to become better. That's why I have some expectations. But if there is too much stress on that expectation, then what the other person feels is that the love has become conditional. That unless I meet this expectation, I will not get any love. So it's it's a subtle dividing line <coughs> where uh, naturally as parents, you know, we would want the, uh, our children to choose a healthy course of action by which they have a bright career ahead for them. So it's natural that we have some expectations based on our understanding of what is good for them. But at the same time, they are, they are also conscious beings who have their own free will. And uh, sometimes when the child goes from being maybe a preteen to a teenager, they start asserting their free will very strongly at that time. So, I think Mark Twain is an American thinker. He said, uh, it's, many people have said something similar, but it is, what he said is that when I was 15, my father was a fool. Now I am 25 and I am and I'm amazed how much the old guy has learned in the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> now, so at 15, they think I am right. What do you know? At 25 when they start taking responsibilities. Oh, you know, life is much tougher than what I thought. Yeah, my parents do know a lot. So what happens is that there is a different dynamics at different ages. So we have to see their consciousness and at one level they need to feel accepted as, as they are. But acceptance doesn't mean that we have no expectation. Yes, we want them to, we want everyone to grow, everyone to improve. So if we understand their emotional state <coughs> properly, then we can, we can discern when they need acceptance and when they need a dose of pushing, when we have to stress the expectation. So I think uh, getting out of our head and just hearing them, understanding them, trying to empathize with their feelings 
will help us uh, help us best help them sometimes we just impose our expectations on them and then we don't understand them so well so even if we are telling them something which is good it 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 doesn't register in them see before people will understand us they have to be feel understood they have to feel understood by us say if we are sick and we go to a doctor and we sit in front of a doctor's table and doctor says okay take this medicine take this medicine take this medicine what i didn't even tell you what is wrong i said i know what is wrong with you now even if the doctor is so expert that they can just see at a glance and tell what is wrong with us still if we don't feel that the doctor doctor is understood by diagnosis by, by problems we will not take this medicines so the doctor has to not only understand the patient but doctor has to make the patient also feel that i have understood you and then when the doctor gives a prescription the doctor the patient will take it is more likely to take it so similarly the children feel understood then <coughs> depending on what the age is then you can see whether they need to be pushed uh, or they need to be accepted and sometimes it's not a one time decision it has to be a decision which has to be iterated you might choose one particular school but at that time if it's a very challenging school then at that time more expect acceptance will be needed because the expectation is going to come from society already so then okay even if you don't do that acceptance will be required but if it's a school where it's relatively not much so much competition then they are already reasonably good in their so the acceptance and sense of value is already there then maybe expectation is more required at that place okay yeah. hare krishna thank you hare krishna okay. any other questions i have a question yeah please how do i regulate my emotions and help my child regulate his emotions okay how do we regulate your uh, regulate our emotions and how do you help say others our children to regulate our emotions because this is yeah. on us and it does come i can see that it does come in their behavior what i am doing yeah that's true actually we are doing a retreat on this topic uh, itself i'm coming on saturday okay <laughs> but that's so. a burning question in me which i really want to <laughs> talk to you about yeah so, so in the retreat uh, the topic is burn anger before anger burns you i want to speak elaborately on this burn <laughs> anger before anger burns you so how to process our emotions but broadly um, speaking that um, see emotions in themselves are not necessarily good or bad are not necessarily good or bad hmm? emotions are simply psychological reactions to life events just as we have physical reactions to life events say if the if the weather turns cold ev some people may be extremely vulnerable to cold just a little cold and they want to put two three layers of clothes some people it is so cold and yes they go out as if there is no cold at all so now each body is different and somebody shivering in the cold we can't tell them don't feel cold what do you mean don't feel cold <laughs> <laughs> that is the almost like a involuntary reaction so now just as if our body is cold sensitive we we can't wish away that cold but at the same time we can prepare ourselves okay let me wear warm clothes and if i have to go out i will go out but not without warm clothes so that warm clothes will act as a protection with protection against the involuntary negative reaction of my body so similarly say each is each body is different each mind is different so some minds may be particularly more emotional than others so some people may get angry very quickly some people may get uh, de depressed very quickly some people may become judgmental very quickly whatever so now if this is the case it's not necessarily or intrinsically a bad thing it just a first thing is just observe that this is the way my mind reacts so if it tend to get angry just see it as a psychological reaction to life events if somebody doesn't do what i tell them to do or what they have promised to do i get angry 
So rather than seeing, just labeling ourselves as short-tempered or anything like that, okay, this is the way my mind works. That doesn't necessarily mean this is the way I am. But because my mind works this way, so when if I tend to get cold, then I wear warm clothes. So if I if I know that this is my this is the way my mind works, then I can prepare myself. Okay. So as soon as I know, if we know also some people, they are going to get angry, or they are going to not do what they tell us to do, and in their presence, we will get angry. So then we prepare in advance. In this situation, I am likely to get angry. So let me, let me prepare for it. Or well, how do I prepare? It could be that. No, if we know in advance, I might explode. So we might go prepared. As soon as I start getting angry, I may take a few deep breaths. I may chant a few mantras, or I may decide that before this argument starts escal escalating, let me walk away from here. Or let me, when we become a little cooler, let me talk about it at that time. So basically, first is acknowledge our nature, maybe emotionally vulnerable in a non-judgmental way, mm -hmm. and then. Prepare to deal with it in the sense that don't get carried away by it. Mm -hmm. So that is a that requires what can be called as processing. Some we usually go there's two ways with emotions: either I express my emotion or I repress my emotion. But in between can we process the emotion? So when we <coughs> create some space for ourselves for processing the emotion, now how to create that space? That will depend on person to person, situation to situation. Sometimes it might be some friend with whom we can talk. Sometimes it might be like a journal that we write. Sometimes it might be that we just pray and introspect and be alone and then process the emotions just by maybe talking with ourselves. But we need some way to process our emotions. Mm -hmm. So some people just go out for a fast jog, basically work the energy out of system. It will that will that process the emotions. Then when we process the emotions, so acknowledge, process at the second step, and then act. So okay, it's not that my emotion is entirely. I just want I have to do everything my emotion tells me to do, but it's not that I can't do anything that my emotion tells me to do. After I processed it, then I can act in a way that is constructive, that is effective. So. Many times, we get stuck in the first level itself. Instead of acknowledging that this is my mind's nature, either we deny it, or we uh, either we deny it or we accept it as our own at our as our own nature. It is not our nature; it is mind's our mind's nature. <coughs> so either we deny it. I am not short-tempered. Like sometimes, some people resolve, "I am not going to get I am not going to get angry now." From New Year, no more anger. I am not going to get angry. And then they get angry. And somebody starts telling them, see you are getting angry. I am not angry. <laughs> <laughs> so, denying is of no use. But at the same time, accepting it as our own nature. I am short tempered and this is the way I am. That is also not helpful. So, acknowledge, process and then act. It's a broad way to uh, deal with our emotions maturely. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. This retreat, what you are saying, is this Saturday? Yeah, it's this weekend, Saturday, yes. Sunday.
So with chanting only, can we achieve liberation? See, there is always a process and there is a purpose. So now the process will normally take us to the purpose. Just like say, if you want to go from Brisbane to Melbourne and there is a straight expressway, just keep driving, we will get to Melbourne. Just keep driving on this road. Now, in principle, it is true. Keep driving, you'll get there. <clears throat> but at the same time, there are things to keep in mind. That if I'm driving, uh, am I driving on the right road? If I take a wrong turn, I won't get there. If I'm driving, but I'm still pressing my brakes, then my wheels are moving, but my car is not moving. Because the brakes are there. So, uh, basically, the process has to lead to the effect. <coughs> what is the effect? The effect is that, so chanting, the it's, it is said in many scriptures that chanting the names of the divine will lead us to liberation. That is true. But, chanting can be done in different ways. If somebody is chanting simply ritualistically, just for doing it for the sake of doing it, that will lead to some benefit, but minimal benefit. It is because, see, with a physical journey, nobody will be so foolish as to press the brake and keep driving. Because <coughs> with the physical journey, you can actually very easily see whether we are moving forward or not. Hmm. Uh, but with respect to the inner journey, the journey of consciousness, it's not so easy to perceive. So, broadly, there are two ways of perceiving whether we are moving forwards. One is that our attachment to the material decreases and second is our attachment to the divine increases. <coughs> so when the attachment to the material decreases, that means uh, not that we become irresponsible or uncaring, but that lust, anger, greed, envy, pride, illusion, these are decreasing. And then the other is our eagerness, our attachment to Krishna increases, our attachment to the divine increases. Then eagerness to hear, eagerness to associate, eagerness to do spiritual things. We may, we may or may not be able to do them more, but our longing to do them more increases. If these two things are happening, and ideally speaking, or even naturally speaking, by chanting, these two things will happen. But if you are chanting ritualistically, then that may not happen at all. If somebody is chanting and say, watching movies, then they are not even trying to move forwards. So it's that that will not happen. Chant, now we may say nobody we will not watch movies, but our mind also keeps showing us a movie. <laughs> and if you keep watching the mind's movie and not really focus on Krishna, and say, hey, this person did like this, you know, that happened on that day. This is like this, that's like that. If we keep watching the mind's movie, then we will not move forwards. Because we are not focusing on Krishna, we are not connecting with Krishna. So it is. There is ritual and there is spiritual. So ritual will take us to the spiritual when we stay, when we are aware of the spirit. Spirit plus ritual becomes spiritual. The spirit is that I should be moving away from matter and moving towards Krishna. And with that intention when we do the ritual, then the ritual takes us to the spiritual. But if that intention is not there, then the ritual may just be like driving with the brake pressed. Does that answer your question? Okay, Hare Krishna. Is this one in the same context to apply? Since I've started chanting, I used to do Om Namah Shivai, you know, <coughs> Jap all my life. But I've recently started since past one year, Hare Krishna Jap. And I look back, I can see myself one year back, 
wanting certain things, enjoying certain things, and I look now, and I've changed so much, I've changed so much, it's unbelievable. I look back and I see that person, I can smile at that person, but I'm not that person, and there's no sadness that I don't want to watch movies, I don't want to go out to eat, like, we don't, we've got rid of TV at home, but I, there's no longing anymore, and if someone would have told me this one year back that you would be like this, I'd be like, what rubbish, you know, I'm never going to change, you know, I enjoy watching movies, I love going out to eat, but it does change you, like Rabu said, it definitely takes you somewhere. You know, there's sometimes I have that longing to be like that, to be that carefree, to enjoy, but then I realize that's not reality, that's, that's, I don't know how to explain it, but you know, the higher taste when they talk about that, that's what I feel I'm acquiring, I don't know if it's, it's true, but a lot of changes, like you must have noticed yourself, so much changes, so if you do chanting regularly, it definitely shifts something in you. So are you happy now or were you happy before? I, that's what, I thought I was happy before, but it was empty, it was lacking, and I didn't realize while I was there. It's like, you know, when you live in India, you're happy. When we lived in Melbourne, we were happy. You know, after coming to Brisbane, I realized the climate, the pollution, you know, how it affects you. So when you are in that reality, you're fine with it. But when you step away, when you get something better, I, I think that's what's happening to me. You know, there are sometimes I look and I go like, oh my God, I used to teach Hollywood dancing along with yoga. Now I can't, I can't even listen to that music anymore. I don't enjoy it. So... I don't know if I'm becoming weird or if it's, you know, the changes of chanting. I hope it is. So, yeah. For me, it's okay. different. You know, when you talk about the mountain, you say going up the mountain. If you're happy down the mountain, why bother going up? Yes, there is a way to go up the mountain. But if you're happy, your life is happy in the mountain, that's it. So, like, I give an example. An ant can only see to here. Whereas, uh, you know, a giraffe can see everywhere. Well, if the ant is happy where it is, why you want to elevate all these things? You want to go up the mountain. What is there in the mountain? Up at the mountain. Mm. I don't. I don't know. Maybe you. But there is something. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm scared too. I'm scared too. Yeah, I'll okay. I'll, I'll address. <laughs> it's several several <laughs> points can come up over there. Let me address them one by one. So <clears throat> I'll address his point, then I'll come to your point also. So yes. <clears throat> so if somebody is happy at the bottom of the mountain, why need to go up? Yeah, there are two different things over here. One is <coughs> uh, our perception of happiness and the other is the reality of happiness. Say, now a person who is, who, say somebody who drinks alcohol, if they take a little alcohol and they understand, no, I'm drunk. I'm drunk now and if I have to go from the bar, I can't drive now. So, let me call someone else to drive or let me drive with someone else. So, when we are little drunk, when we understand we are drunk. But, when we become very drunk, then somebody says, you should not drive now. You are drunk. Oh, we are drunk. <laughs> so, so, so what happens is, that person may think I am normal, but that person, I am fine, but they may not be fine. Now, it is not always the case, but I am just saying that, the perception of a person who is very high on alcohol, they think I'm happy, but they might ab about to topple and crack their skull also. So there is the perception of happiness and there is the reality of happiness. So now at the bottom of the mountain also, we all can be happy in different ways. The problem however is that, that happiness is like a bubble. It's like a bubble. It can burst at any moment. It, that happiness is very contingent, it is very conditioned, it depends on certain condition, contingencies, certain conditions. So I am happy right now because my health is good, my family is good, my job is good, life is looking up. But life can change in one moment and then where is my happiness after that? So yes, at the bottom of the it is at the bottom of the, in the material situation that we are in, we can also be happy. And it is not that we are meant to be unhappy there. But it is just that, that happiness is often very dependent on externals. And as we evolve in our consciousness, we actually learn to seek happiness in bigger things. For a child, the conception of happiness is a toy. 
If I have this toy, I'm happy. If I don't have that toy, I'm miserable. But as a child grows, okay, toy is nice, but there are bigger and better things in life. So basically, as we grow, our conception of what is the source of our happiness, it expands. We start seeking bigger things. And this evolution of consciousness, it is meant to take us ultimately to the realization that I need to find happiness in the eternal. So, uh, that eternal means that I, I at my core am eternal. Or at least, even if I don't accept it, maybe let me explore it. Because I always want lasting happiness. So, how will I get that lasting happiness? Uh, the Bhagavad Gita says in the sixth chapter, Yam labdva chaparam labham manyate nadhikam tataha yasmin sthitona dukkhena gurunapi vichalyate. 6.22 it says that that is the state of consciousness. This is describing the vision at the top of the mountain. It says that if you attain that yam labdva chaparam labham manyate nadhikam tataha. That having attained this, there is nothing more to be attained. There is nothing more to be attained. Manyate. One doesn't feel there is anything more to be attained. That means there is the crave, there is no more craving to achieve something else. There is no gnawing dissatisfaction that I want more, I want more, I want more. And Yasmin Stito na dukhe na gurunapi vichalyate. At that stage, even if distress comes, we will not be devastated by the distress. We will get that inner resilience by which we can deal with it. So, <clears throat> now from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain, people can move in two different ways. One is, the bottom of the mountain is so miserable that I want something better in my life. That it has to be something else. So that could be because of distress somebody moves up. The other could be, the bottom of the mountain is, is happy. <coughs> But it's not enough. It's not enough means, okay, I've achieved my dreams, I've got what I wanted, but I'm not, full, I'm not fulfilled. Is there something more to life? So both ways one can move up the mountain. So being satisfied at the bottom of the mountain may happen for those people who are in a materially good condition, but even they need to move up the mountain because that condition is not going to last. And some people may not be satisfied at the bottom of the mountain. But most people, what they do is, instead of going up the mountain, they start going around the mountain. Okay. Okay, here I am not, here things are not good. Maybe here things will be good. <laughs> good point. But to go up the mountain, hmm. let's talk practical. Like, yeah. we are kids, we are family, everything. Okay. You can't just think about, okay, I want to go up the mountain. That's why I talk about... Your family will be on top of you, you will go nowhere. <coughs> <laughs> no, that's why I said. That's the reality. That's I agree with you. Up the mountain, everyone can go. Okay, but I'm just trying to be. Yeah, I understand. No, that's why is going up the mountain is it? What about our family? Uh, they may not want to go, or it may be difficult. That's why bhakti yoga is inclusive. That's why I talk about there are different ideas, ways of spirituality. There are some ways of spirituality is that we leave the world and and go towards higher. But there are other ways where we see the world as a means to go towards the higher reality. That the world can take us away from God, but the world, if it is seen properly and used properly, can also be a tool to go towards God. So that means we, uh, if I see the world as meant for my enjoyment, then the world will put me in illusion. But if I see the world, uh, by world I am using metaphorically, the things in the world, if I see the world as ultimately coming from God, as whatever worldly position I have, it is by God's arrangement. So let me use it in the mood of service. So then the world itself can become a tool towards God. So Arjun was a great archer. And he practiced his archery and excelled in his archery. But he used that in the service of Krishna. And by excelling in his archery, he also served Krishna and grew towards Krishna. So it's not that... Uh, the the bottom of the mountain is not so much a physical state as a consciousness. So the bottom of the mountain is character. When I say from material to spiritual, material is what material essentially means self-centered, and spiritual means God-centered. So it is a journey in which it's not so much what we 
what positions we give up as what conceptions we give up. We may keep the positions, but if a conception is, okay, this is mine, then that is material consciousness. But this is God's in my care right now, in my responsibility. Then that can take us towards spirituality. So that's why the essence of spiritual growth is not so much about giving up possessions, but it is about more about giving up conceptions. The conception that is mine, if I give it up, then even if I keep the position, but still I can be in spiritual consciousness. Okay. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now, regarding your point that uh, say, uh, in the past you enjoyed something such as watching movies, now you don't feel like it at all. So this can be seen in two different ways. One is that some people may feel, oh, if I become spiritual, I have to give all this up. That's what I was thinking. And then, hey, then that's too much. I don't want to do this. <clears throat> so there is, you could say, um, organic renunciation. <laughs> <laughs> and you could say there is, there is artificial renunciation. So artificial renunciation is where somebody has the desire to do certain things but just in order to, because somebody else is pressuring them or because they want to portray a particular image to others, they give up those things. Mm -hmm. And that is not sustainable and that is not so desirable also. But organic renunciation is where, where people just if I have something something better to do in my life. So it's not that one way that okay movies are bad and that's why I give them up. Now that would be a that would be like a too much of a generalization. Not all movies are bad. And there are movies about various different subjects and you will have to see them on merit. But somebody may feel that okay, I have better things to I have better things to do in my life. So, in fact, recently only I read somewhere, many of the uh, many of the leaders of the whole software industry in Silicon Valley in America, they are very careful to monitor the TV and social media usage for their children. They are providing technology for the whole world to do that, yes. but they are monitoring it themselves very carefully. So that means that uh, they also recognize that this can lead people in the, an unwanted path. <coughs> so for us, there are broadly, you could say, three different phases in the way we look at the world. It's continue the same thing. We could say one is we romanticize worldly things. Romanticize means Oh, this is so enjoyable. If I just get this, all my dreams will be fulfilled. Now, romance we may use in terms of a particular relationship where I think I get a particular dream partner. But we romanticize so many things also. So one is that we romanticize worldly things. If I just get this, my life will be happy. Hmm? This is so enjoyable. And the other would be, other extreme is to demonize it. This is so terrible. This is so bad. This is like this. This is like that. This is like that. Just give it up. And in between, the bhakti way is to utilize. Don't romanticize, don't demonize, but utilize. So if somebody, say for example, feels that, okay, I don't want to watch movies. I am not interested in this Bollywood kind of music. That's, uh, that's, if you are not interested, that's fine. But somebody else might have a different perspective that, okay, this Bollywood kind of music is a popular music. I am interested in spirituality, but can I present spirituality using this music? This kind of music, genre of music, and they, because of that they study that or they learn that and they use that. That might enhance their spiritual consciousness, that might enhance other people's spiritual consciousness. So we don't want to go into the zone of demonizing things. We also don't want to romanticize things. This itself is the source of ultimate happiness. 
but we shouldn't think that this is the source of the ultimate evil also but rather if it is of utility to me i'll utilize it and uh, sometimes if we are living in the world uh, we have to to some extent be as the world is we don't want to be alienated from the world we don't want to be consumed by the world also but we don't want to be alienated by the world also so <clears throat> that means that when interacting with uh, depending on whom we are interacting with <coughs> we need to find out how we can connect with them and do what it takes to connect with them so if uh, just because we are spiritual does that mean that now we don't talk about with every single person we just talk only about krishna we don't talk about say anything else well not necessarily most often we have to establish a human connection with people before we can establish a spiritual connection with them we would like to have a spiritual connection but in the human connection and sometimes for a human connection certain subjects need to be talked about otherwise we will be classed as weird as you said then then we don't have to be like that we can have a spiritual intention but we talk what is normal the one prabhupad shri prabhupad is the founder of iskon so he he was at a he visited a particular place in america and in that place that there was like a condo on one side the devotees were staying other side there was a old lady who was staying and this old lady had complained to the council about the devotees they are so noisy they are this they are the hippies and they are this and the devotees were facing a lot of problems in continuing in doing kirtan in doing their various activities so sometimes the uh, sometimes we may over simplify things by so the the, the devotees told prabhupada this this lady is so terrible she's against spirituality she's against bhakti she's she's opposing us and when prabhupada prabhupada had gone for a morning walk when they told this when prabhupada came back he was coming to the temple side he went to the other side and he knocked on the door and then she opened and prabhupada started talking with her and when prabhupada was talking he for for several minutes he was just talking typical old people this how are you where are your children how is your health how is this and the devotees were waiting when well, prabhupada talked about krishna when prabhupada talked about chanting hari krishna prabhupada did not talk anything and then when he finished then prabhupada just greeted her wished her well and left and the devotees had a big question mark on their face what happened and then prabhupada said sometimes old people get lonely and that's why they become irritable that's why they become irritable and that's all prabhupada said and prabhupada left and then later on that lady came to the when the lady the devotee met that lady she said your swami is such a nice person and of course prabhupada also told the devotee don't do kirtan so loudly in this area they the devotee adjusted and she also withdrew her complaints so prabhupad brought her closer to krishna without speaking one word about krishna so basically we need to act with people in a way that they don't they don't think that we are weird we don't have to compromise our principles but we can focus on try to connect with them at a human level then it won't be that we will become alienated because of our bhakti okay hari krishna so shall we stop here so <laughs> so thank you very much shri prabhu pad ki jai gaur bhakt vrind ki jai gaur premanand ki jai also like